Thank you everyone for joining us today and connecting for our first uh, Wellness Week event. My name is Riccardo Conti and I'm the Managing Director for Fantini North America, although right now I'm uh, at our headquarters here in Italy on Lake Orta. Uh, so this year has been a year like uh, quite unique, like um, probably no other in uh, recent uh, time. And we all um, discovered or maybe some of us rediscovered how important health and uh, well-being well -being is uh, for all of us, for us, for ourselves and our loved ones. And uh, Wellness Week is a series of events. Uh, we have three events, the first one today and two more this week on the Thursday, January 28th and on the 29th. So um, Wellness Week is a, is a series of events uh, sponsored by Fantini where we have the opportunity to learn from um, professionals, from the experts on uh, how we can uh, incorporate um, uh, wellness uh, through uh, various actions and initiatives uh, into our homes, our projects and uh, our lives too. Uh, today we have um, a, a incredibly, um, an incredibly talented panel of uh, North American designers and uh, the topic of today's uh, event is how to design with wellness in mind. Fantini um, is a designer and, uh, and manufacturer um, of products. We're, we're very um, humble uh, also to share with you uh, today how um, our effort daily is, um, is obviously to incorporate beauty and functionality and comfort uh, into our products. But, uh, uh, but ultimately, and I really uh, reinforce like the ultimately as the, as the end goal um, is really for our products to, to improve the experience. And uh, because uh, a better experience also uh, plays a fundamental role in, in our users' uh, well-being and wellness. So uh, this said, um, before we begin today, I have a couple of uh, uh, housekeeping rules uh, that I'd like to cover. Uh, so first, everybody is on mute and it will be for the whole duration of the, uh, of the talk, uh, with the exception of our uh, panel, of course. And uh, second, we will have um, a section at the end with the Q&A and uh, you can find a function uh, to ask a question at the top or the bottom of your screen, depending on um, what kind of device you're using to, to connect. Uh, you do not have to wait until the end of the talk to ask a question. You can write any time um, and it will be, um, uh, we will be, uh, uh, sort of, um, they will be sorted out. And then uh, the ones that will not be covered uh, live today, they will be answered via email. So at this point, um, I'll let the panelists introduce themselves. Hello, it's nice to be with you all. My name is Cindy Rendley. I'm an architect currently living and working in Toronto, Canada. I have a small award-winning design studio that focuses on architecture, interiors, landscape, and product design. And our body of work includes res residential and community projects, plus exhibition and commercial spaces. Uh, prior to becoming an architect, I trained as a goldsmith, jeweler, and metal artist. And I still have a continued interest in designing and detailing at all scales. Uh, and interesting, currently we're working on some prototypes for a line of tabletop objects and housewares, uh, which is actually taking me full circle back to my roots as a goldsmith. Uh, in addition, I'm an adjunct professor at Ryerson University at the Faculty of Communication and Design in the Interiors uh, Department, uh, as we enjoy doing all of that holistically from our office. And so I'm sharing that with, with students and that's a privilege. And I'm happy to be here with you today. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Alessandro Munje. And um, like Cindy, I'm actually here from Toronto. Um, founder and design director here at Studio Munje. Now, we're a Toronto-based company, a studio that really is focusing on uh, luxury residential, hospitality experiences, I'd say, and really all around the world, um, really from Canada to 
across the US to Asia, um, and some of the most exciting markets really. Um, our team is over about 60 people split into two countries really in North America and Asia and consists of architects and designers and technologists, and project managers, FF&E designers, industrial designers and uh, amazing marketing team and management team which really kind of allows us to create a very unique and tailored experience in all of our projects. Um, kind of always following a design narrative uh, where we really don't focus on stamping out our work. And so it makes our portfolio very unique for each one of our clients making sure that we're essentially tailoring every solution to all the projects uh, that we uh, take on. Our team also allows for an extended scope of work, which includes architecture and design landscaping and product design, uh, which has been a big focus of our business, which has been a very exciting pro focus of our business, actually. Um, it really kind of allows us to be as creative and as expressive as um, in, and almost kind of controlling the environments that we're able to create. And so. You know, I have to say that we're quite blessed, certainly under these times, uh, to be with the most exciting clients and independent hotel companies to branded hotels like Park Hyatt and Shangri-Las and Rosewood, Ritz, Carlton's and Equinox and Nobu's and MGM's and of course our private residential and our world-class developers. So lots of exciting things. I really kind of feel like every day is a day in a sandbox for me. So that's me. Hello, I'm Kristen Seidel, and I am an architect practicing in California. My practice is based in Berkeley, which is just outside of San Francisco, and we do a range of residential, commercial, and office space throughout uh, Northern California. And I think we'll jump to it from there. Thank you, everybody. Um, I'm Beth Dickstein with BDE. We represent Fantini, and I've been asked to pose the questions. So everyone is looking very forward to this discussion. And the first question, uh, and Kristen, if you'll go first. Um, with most people being confined to their homes, the bathroom has become somewhat of a sanctuary. What is your process or approach when designing a bathroom and how has it changed in the past year? So our approach always begins with talking very closely and comfortably with the client about what they are looking for in the bathroom. There's some obvious, very functional needs that everyone has, but we spend a lot of time talking about how to meet the more experiential and material and spatial needs and how we can address that through different material choices and different product choices. It's always super important to us to emphasize natural light. And I think that's something that has come um, into a new level of importance during um, the pandemic times when people feel like they wanna have a connection to outdoors but are often much more connected to the indoors. Um, a connection to nature is also very important. And the two things that have become even more important recently are focusing on acoustics so that people when they're in the bathroom don't have to hear the Zoom calls going on in other parts of the house or the meals that people are cooking, but so that people can really feel like they are having a bit of an escape when they get to the bathroom. So a renewed focus on acoustics. And there's also been a renewed focus on how to do really elegant storage in the bathroom, realizing that there's more clutter perhaps than ever before, but not wanting to see that clutter, that people are collecting more items in the house, but want to make it really efficient. So I'd say that's something that has taken on a new level of importance. And then the other thing that we're starting to see a lot more interested in, um, interest in is that people have a renewed appreciation for the value of really good products. So even though people always did appreciate and seek out um, well-made and beautiful objects, I think that more than ever before, people don't want to compromise and they wanna make sure that they're putting the best objects and the most beautiful things in their bathroom because there's a feeling that you're with all these items so much of the day, so much of the week. And so seeing something beautiful and being able to appreciate it brings a whole new level of happiness. Thank you. Alessandro. Mm, no, I totally echo a lot of what Kristen said too. It's some, um, you know, I, I, it's absolutely true that people are confined to their homes. And of course, some are dealing with it well and some are not so well, but you know, I think throughout the globe, there's change that's definitely required and be able to escape into your homes and experience something as simple as your bathroom um, in a more luxurious manner really helps you escape 
what's going on in the world today, quite frankly, and immerse into something different. Um, to us, bathrooms are like about connecting people to the essential elements of water, really. I mean, it's, um, it's about our daily life. It's what we believe in the importance of investing in high quality fixtures, just like she put like Christian said, and really kind of the kind of fixtures that Fentini produces, quite frankly. Um, and really it's about that investing in the quality so that you know, you're ensuring your daily rituals in life are essentially are effortless. Um, the design has to be experimental, you know, immersive and unique. Um, bathrooms are no exceptions. Um, they must evoke in our minds a sense of emotion. Um, and so that's why you see the kind of diversity that you see even in our portfolio. Uh, we always kind of work on a certain narrative in order to get that um, design to where it is. Um, and each client comes with unique narrative as a result of that. And so um, at the same time, I also believe that bathrooms can be soothing and relaxing and um, it's very spa-like, but at the same time, they could also be exciting and you know entertaining and, and sexy even. And such as in some of the projects that you're seeing here, and um, yeah, so I think that you know when I think about um, where bathrooms are even going and the kind of immersive experience that people are um, trying to capture and get. I mean, even the one that you're seeing on the screen is a really good one that we did up in. The, it's like in a, in a loft space of the Williamville Hotel in New York City in Brooklyn, and there's this really cool box, glass box on the corner that you know, where the human body is even becoming artwork for the spaces below. So as you're moving within the spaces, it almost becomes an installation. So to conceptualize, you know, um, where the tradition of bathing in a shower is goes beyond just, um, so that tradition of bathing it actually becomes like an art installation. It's pretty cool. So I don't know if there's any limits, I guess is my point. I always like to explore those and see um, where the magic can come. Even quite frankly, in this one here is a hotel project where you know, in this moment, things are meant to be calming and soothing and relaxing and where water itself is meant to, you know, almost create this gorgeous effect of reflection in the ceiling. And even as you're lying there to see how water can be immersive and goes beyond, you know, even what the faucet does. So um, environment is everything when it comes to these kind of spaces. I love that you put relaxing and exciting in the same <laughs> sentence. And I think that's exactly true, right? I mean, I mean bathrooms can be, because you often think to yourself, you know, a bathroom is a place to sort of relax and, and um, you know, sort of have a sort of a different kind of sensorial moment. But I mean, if you go to one of our hotels like Visha, bathrooms are not meant for that. <laughs> bathrooms are actually, sure, they'll have the function, but it's meant to have fun. And, uh, and we've seen tremendous parties happening there, you know, when the hotel was open. But yet there's also times in residential work and spa-like environments where they need to come down. So... Um, that's why I love the, the concept of designing through narrative as opposed to sort of cookie cutter. Cindy. Sure. Uh, my answer to this question, I'd like to focus on actually two words. And one is um, sanctuary as, as part of the main question. And two, actually hotels of which Alessandro um, has spoken about already uh, and how the impact of staying in a hotel like the examples that we've seen uh, on the screen from Alessandro, I've had the experience when clients come home, they've been in a place like that, and they now want to emulate that and have that in their own private dwelling in their own private spaces. So even prior to COVID, and certainly it's been exacerbated and magnified uh, times a thousand since COVID, because people are confined to their homes, they want that luxury of that sanctuary even more and more in their own personal spaces. So as I said, so even before COVID, but even now I've had two or three projects recently where people want a space that they almost don't have to leave. And I have, uh, this is part of a project actually that's on the screen right now, um, as well as another one that we haven't seen quite yet. Um, where people are wanting a space that has adjacent spaces that allow them to sleep, work, eat, have a fire, watch TV, have a glass of wine, make a cappuccino, have a bath with the glass doors open to the outside adjacent uh, open space and deck, and they never want to leave. Um, so that's been a really interesting uh, an interesting design puzzle to solve and 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 specifically we'll have people come back from a trip and say I stayed in this place and 
the bed was like this and the cappuccino corner was over here. And um, I had a little desk to work on in the corner, but I could see the gorgeous view of the ocean. So trying to emulate that in someone's dwelling is a very exciting and actually a luxurious thing to try to, um, to have to have to have the that's a gift to have that problem to that design puzzle to solve. Um, so it, 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 even in, in whether you have the budget or if it's even in a smaller budget, one can create sanctuary spaces. All the words that Kristen has already said and Alessandra has already said, trying to create a calm, a serenity, an oasis, uh, and a private world that is turned off from all of the electronics and the Zoom calls and the FaceTimes, et cetera. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, you know, going back to what Kristen said, my next question is, as a designer, how do you incorporate light and nature into your projects? And what benefit do you think that has for the end user? And we'll start with you, Alessandro. Sure. I mean, really, I think this would be, um, if, you, if anybody's ever seen Fantini's uh, at offices on Lake Orta, like they'll see how, how that answer is so evident, right? Where the concept of connection to mother nature. You know, um, we kind of try to do that in, when we have the luxury of being in environments like that, uh, where they're out in the open and in, in forests and lakes and such, there's an easier ability to connect both inside and outside. But when urban settings like this project here that you're seeing on the screen in our Nobu project, we try to infuse that um, and, and, and control that. So in this case here, this was an outdoor space that we cut a hole through the building and allowed uh, mother nature to come within and infuse spaces below that are otherwise dark and depressing and say like, where those challenges I think are something that we thrive in. And so um, you get to see how the seasons change much like you would in like in a Fantini factory example, you get to see how, you know, in this case here where even through exercise in and of itself as wellness, you get to see how the seasons continues to participate. And as you get motivated and energized, you know, it's, it's winter, it's summer, it's spring. And I mean, thankfully in our city, we get to see all four seasons. And this is almost it becomes like a show window to it in an urban setting, or in this case here, when you're going through, you know, a sales office and, you know, having water sort of experience that moment for you. Um, and, and I think there's just such a beauty about how the indoor spaces connect to the outdoor spaces, outdoor spaces connect to the indoor spaces. And I find it so fundamental, but frankly in life even, um, because really you can't live without the other, right? One is totally reliant on the other. And it's our job, I think, as designers to be able to balance it in both uh, an urban or suburban or even an open retreat sort of setting. Um, and I think controlling that, even through immersing people through light and, and such when, when it does turn into dark, like we can totally play with people's emotions and through textures and, and, and evoke those feelings that you want them to control. Like even quite frankly, in this one, an indoor pool that was again in a really you know, difficult space to create in design in our in this place with building with Norman Foster. Like here, I can imagine as people are swimming in this body of water, their eye levels are at a wall that is super calm and simple and illuminated with light. Whereas if they're relaxing, when doing backstrokes, you can see back into the skyline, but always ignoring that that city line that you're seeing in this picture, right? So that we can we can control that through design. And I love sort of playing that role where we pop into people's heads and imagine what they can do within spaces and control it. Right? So, um, yeah, I think light is definitely an important element to any project we do, whether it be that you get it naturally or you don't. Um, and, and when you don't, I think there's ways to control that, whether it's through uh, indirect lighting or, uh, you know, incandescent lighting or whatever it is, but, and, and control the mind and the body, the experience and the soul. So, um, this was kind of cool too, where there's a house in LA where we're allowing our, our residential client to kind of immerse through all of these heads to be able to even experience what water would feel like from an indoor to outdoor experience, right? So you can shower inside and you can shower outside, three heads inside, three heads outside to kind of bring in that sense of luxury and overdoing it. And why not? <laughs> Thanks so much, Cindy. Um, I'd like to say that, you know, whether you have a small scale project or a large scale project, 
an urban project or something that's out in nature, a small cabin in the woods or a small cottage on the lake. Uh, and whether you have a small budget or a large budget, budget um, as Alessandro also has already mentioned, but I can add to it, light can be used as a material. And light, natural light is free. And natural light is inexpensive in the sense that, you know, you don't have to pay big dollars for big tricks and big design uh, solutions in order to be able to just sort of grab some natural light wherever possible. Um, I, while that, this project is up, the previous slide and this slide now, um, you know, this is a smaller project, but again, a client wanting that feeling that, you know, is in these larger grand hotel spaces, but in a more realistic day-to-day -day, um, environment to just, you know, when you're picking your windows and you're picking your doors, large expanses, large openings, pivoting, sliding, awning, or even if you know you don't have the budget for anything other than just a casement window that opens, but putting windows in the right location, whether they're skylights from above or they're uh, windows adjacent to a washing area or tub area, just the, the organization of the space and the access to natural light is key, key, key. And then on top of that, if you do have a bit of a budget and you can uh, implement interesting design details where you can have concealed lighting, where you can create a mood, you can create a, a, a feeling of uh, either mystery or darkness or highlighting or emphasizing materials or a space or a corner. Uh, so light is a very powerful uh, tool that heightens the feeling and heightens one's experience in a place or space. And just, you know, in addition to that, you're bringing the outside in, you're bringing nature in, you're bringing, uh, you're, you're framing views for people. If you're lucky enough to be viewing a mountain or an ocean or a lake, uh, to, to, to really think about those views from day one in the schematic design uh, process, uh, the phase of, of, of the design process. And for, laymen who are working with a designer, uh, you know, really steering them in that direction and, and, and communicating how important that is. Hopefully the designer comes to the table knowing that. Just framing views to nature, to uh, green space, to views, all of that just helps add to a feeling and a sense of calm. And again, we said earlier, sanctuary, uh, serenity, uh, zen, and uh, it's easily achievable and sadly sometimes overlooked and there are missed opportunities, um, which can really be achieved in, in, in simple, simple moves with good space planning and good understanding of where the source is of the natural light and where to put the artificial light and the combination of the two, which sometimes is a surprise because sometimes you have a great idea of some concealed lighting element and uh, you need to know how that reacts to natural light. Um, it, you know, there, there, the magic can be the result, but uh, sometimes the natural light and the and the artificial light can be conflicting. So there's a lot of exploration that's necessary, and there's a lot of it's it's a tricky thing to combine the two. The nature part is easy. You got a view to nature, enjoy it, grab it, focus on it, frame it, highlight it, control it, controlling the views. The designer can do that. Um, you know, you can have something luxurious that doesn't have uh, a dollar value attached to it. Thank you. Yeah, no, designers are kings to me. Um, Kristen. And Beth, we agree, by the way, just for whatever yeah, it's no, worth. I, I, we I, totally agree to you that designers are kings. Yeah. I, I tell my family that have... every day. I tell my family every day when I go home, I say, remember, we are kings. So, and, but they don't mm -hmm. listen. And queens. And queens. And queens. And queens, exactly. and queens yes. <laughs> and princesses. And, princesses. and princesses. And princesses. So in Northern California, we are incredibly lucky with the climate that we have and the geography that we have. So I would say pretty much every project we work in um, has a lot of connection between outdoor space and interior space. 
Um, in addition to having a great climate that allows us to spend at least half the year outside, um, we also have a lot of amazing views because of the um, geography and a lot of hills. So we spend a lot of time thinking about how to create a connection between interior and exterior and also how an interior space feels really different in, let's say in the winter when we actually have to close our windows and what the experience is when it's less connected between interior and exterior. And I think a lot of what we do then too is think about how even though we create this connection between interior and exterior, that at different times of year, the climate allows those spaces to be really different. So in the living room, let's say in the summer, there's a very different quality of the kind of window, I'm sorry, the kind of light that we get that time of year um, based on where the sun is located. And so spaces that seem maybe even sometimes quite small will feel very different at different times of the year. We also use, um, natural light, just like um, we were talking about, to make these spaces really exciting. There's ways that shadows and um, bright light can make a space feel different, different times of the day and create a lot of connection. We think a lot about how a window lets you see the, the plants outside, the landscape that is outside, and we spend a lot of time create, creating those connections. Between, um, we do a lot of roof decks that are really important and we do a lot of small little gardens that maybe are a contrast between the big connection of a yard that's adjacent to a small little one that lets you have a different kind of um, flowers or different kinds of bushes that create a different connection that might have a, a view to the whole um, Bay Area view. It's beautiful. My next question is, what materials and textures do you use to create a sense of wellness, whether for a home, a hotel, or even an office? And Cindy, we'll start with you. Um, when I think of well-being and wellness with respect to materials, uh, words such as these come to mind, like calm, serene, quiet, zen, softness, simplicity, natural, nature. And those are, you know, something, those are kind of ephemeral ideas that are not so tangible. And the trick is, uh, this is a space I was talking about earlier where this client never leaves home. She told me she, she, they have about a 4,000 square foot house. And she really works here, sleeps here, eats here, dines here. There's a hidden TV, there's a hidden fridge, there's a hidden fireplace, there's a hidden cappuccino maker. She never has to leave. And it's, it's quite interesting. And everybody else has the run of the house and her husband don't really leave that corner of the world. Um, but the trick is how do you achieve those intangible ideas materially, physically? And for me, it's a lot of, again, this image as well, a lot of natural, neutral, or no color at all, or non, natural, neutral, non. Um, a lot of whites, a lot of, if there's any color, a lot of spa-like shades that are watery, soft blues, soft greens, fabrics that are ephemeral, translucent, that diffuse the light. And again, you don't need a big budget for certain things. If you can't afford, you know, some exquisite linen drapery that just diffuses the light coming in and has this kind of gauze effect, you can put film on a window. You can achieve the very same effect using different materials. And again, I, I'm, I'm speaking very much about varied budgets because not everybody has, you know, a limited, a limit, an unlimited budget. So how do you do that for people? in their day to day. Uh, so natural materials, uh, I really very much try to avoid making one peer, material appear to be something else. If you can't afford that exotic wood, then let's use plastic laminate or some, something in between. I think that good design, if it has good circulation, good access to natural light, good adjacencies, good space planning, good proportions, 
that shouldn't have a dollar value attached to it. That should be what good design is and that you should get that for free within your design budget, within the fees that you're paying. There shouldn't be a premium to all of those things. And then if you have the luxury to layer on that, you know, a materiality and a palette that just kind of accentuates and magnifies that even more. Um, I really don't like to pretend anything is anything else. And I love to stick to natural materials, whether they're stones, woods, or metals. And most of my work is, uh, uh, most of my work is composed of stones, woods, metals, uh, with not a lot of visual noise. I mean, it doesn't even have to be, I know we're talking about washrooms a lot, of course, you know, we're sponsored here by Fantini. They make exquisite jewelry. Their, their, their fixtures are jewelry. They speak very much to me from my other life. Um, but it's not confined to just the washroom. It's uh, confined to all of, the, all of the spaces within a home, within a hotel, within a public space, a private space. Um, just trying to be consistent in a material palette that has a calmness. There's not a lot of visual noise. And if somebody does want some, you know, something more powerful visually, then that can be accented also in very sophisticated ways without, you know, having to use the color or the cool material of the moment, which in three years from now, you're going to think, oh my God, what was I thinking? <laughs> so if you work with natural materials, um, they never really go out of style. They never really go out of fashion. And if you wake, work with a very limited material palette, I think you'll look back in 10 years and say that you're still satis you're satisfied from day one, you were thrilled. And 10 years later, it's still working. Because none of those things go out of style. Thank you. Kristen. For materials, it's always been a critical part of all architecture design. And I think that thinking carefully about all the different aspects of a design coming together and to have the different materials complement a design agenda has always been critical. And I think even more in a time of wellness, it's even more important. Um, we wanna make sure that everything works together, that all of the materials are consistent in the goals that we have. And sometimes it's about something being very soothing and calming and a neutral sense about um, paler colors that have a sense of calm. But I think we're also finding that we are looking for some joy, some color, and we also find that we are often using a bold color that stands out and starts to set some things um, in a more glorious way. Um, just as Cindy said, we have found that Fantini has been a great, great goal to create something exquisite in a bathroom in that even if we have decided to keep things more subtle in terms of a material palette, that really allows the beauty of these really well considered and well executed plumbing fixtures that um, Fantini just does in an excellent way. Um, in terms of new material attitudes and new materials and textures, we're, we're seeing that people are really interested in things that are as um, most healthy as possible. There's a renewed interest in materials that are natural, that, uh, that are non-toxic and that are really emphasizing a healthy quality. We don't think that this is really a design agenda so much. Um, it's important that the design goals are the priority, but then we're then backing it up by keeping healthier um, stains and paints and all of those as a way to reinforce what we're doing. And then I think what we're starting to see even more is a bigger connection to the landscape and to plants, more interior plants and ways to treat the plants, not just as a house plant that might be a pot inside the house, but something that is really integrated into how we're deciding um, how to think about connections between spaces, whether interior to interior, or interior to exterior, and to make them part of the casework and the cabinetry and make that a really integrated way to think about landscape as a texture and a material and a color. Thank you. Um, before I get to you, Alessandro, I just want to remind the audience that we're open for questions and answers. I even have two questions, <laughs> but I'll, I'll put it in the Q&A. Um, Alessandro, you're next. Thank you. Kristen, can you do me a favor? Can you bring some of that sun over to our city, please, if you don't mind? Oh, we have like, so much great sun right now. It's been like 70 it's degrees. <laughs> like for real, like, oh my God. And I hear you talk about those projects going inside to outside, not like six months, like I'm thinking we get three, okay? Like, but there's we a, love them, we love them. <laughs> there's a reason I don't go to Toronto, it's too cold for me. <laughs> hey, hey, don't say that. I hear it's amazing. It's a great city. It's, it's, amazing. <laughs> it's a great city. Um, One of my favorites, I know. 
thank you. Okay. Um, so, no, I'm, I'm material, so, and wellness. So, uh, materials is a big part of our, of our work and our presentations to our clients. I mean, we have a whole area in our studio here designated, a good chunk of the studio designated to materials. And so, and we're very specific about them and, you know, we don't overdo it in terms of the, in the areas that we have. We even have a designated uh, person monitoring our materials, ensuring that we, all of our team gets educated on. So it's such an important part. And like, for us, it doesn't just stop at stone. Like we're actually quite, you know, mesmerized by uh, more tactile materials and, and how they touch right down to even your feet. Like in this one project here, which is a project in Nova Scotia hotel, you know, like that's a hooked rug on the floor. And it's a rug that the client was so um, excited about putting into the project because there's a, a narrative to it there's a there's authenticity to it there's you know there's honesty to it because it's a craft that comes from locally and so it became a part of the immersive experience in a hotel room um, and that became sort of a tactile material that you know you talk about the wellness well I actually believe that there's there's an immersive kind of sensation that comes through your body when you can step down on something that's warm or tactile or textured it makes a big difference to your mood and of course, in these hotel rooms, it's exactly what we want to do is to try to control the mood and the experience. Even in this bathroom, which is just off of that bedroom, you know, these, these stones are also very local um, and, you know, with heated floors. And so, you know, using that to sort of continue to uh, enhance that experience in, in your body, in your mind, in your soul. Um, and so they become always sort of very sensorial in many respects. And that's how we like to use them. We like to be honest about them, but we also want to make sure that they're, you know, um, very, very sensory like. And this is another hotel that's going to open here in Toronto where, you know, we're using materials to sort of, you know, focus your perspective on, on um, you know, city views because you're so high up in the air here. And, you know, again, all very local to within a, you know, a few miles from, from the city core um, to sort of ensure that we're bringing in that material into these spaces that are gonna enhance them in a completely different way, but also play with the textures. And that's the beauty about it, right? You can sort of manage like where one is honed and polished and, you know, and, and flamed, all of these can sort of be um, in that box of sort of being honest with our material. So we're not sort of doing too many tricks uh, within these spaces. Um, but yeah, materials become for us an incredible, incredible uh, source for inspiration and um, an ability to sort of create those black and white images that you start off in your in CAD and such that eventually turn into these beautiful spaces. Um, you know, smell also you can imagine also plays a form of of um, enhancement into your well being. I believe um, you know um, whether it be cedar in in, in saunas or um, you know we're actually doing a project now where. You know, we're using different materials and, and, and wood so that it can cons consistently infuse into the restaurant, uh, which is really exciting to see happen. Um, so materials play a big, big part of it. And then, of course, there's always scents as well that hotels use to identify themselves. And you can imagine you always remember that, right, when you're in these hotel rooms that, um, you know, it kind of speaks back to that brand. So it's very powerful, I guess, is my point to say that um, these materials and these senses are like an important part. Um, to everyday designing and everyday, everybody's lives, quite frankly. So, uh, yeah, we think through these creative details and unique bespoke experience and just based on our design uh, direction, really, that we put forward. So. Thank you. I actually have the scent from the Shangri-La Hotel. So thanks. If you did. Cindy, we lost you there, Cindy. <laughs> oh, I just wanted to add something very quickly to something that Alessandra was talking about because I'm very much about having a reduced material palette, whether it's a you know, 1,000 square foot addition or a 5,000 square foot house, 7,000 square foot spaces. Um, I always, um, my clients are allowed to use one stone, one wood and one metal. But interestingly, um, to, to give an example of what Alessandra was talking about, you can get a multitude of feelings and finishes and desired effects from one material. Instead of someone saying they found this favorite stone and they got to match a tile, you don't have to match a tile. You can bush hammer it, you can sandblast it, you can, you can acid S it, you can, you know, you can, you can hone it, you can polish it, you can get all sorts of different effects from one material without, and, and then it has the same 
color palette and the same hue and you're not trying to match oh you take three weeks to find the right tile that matches this we'll just use you know one from the same part of the planet from the earth and it's all kind of cohesive without trying so hard that's why you are all kings and queens uh last question for you is what are the challenges of designing with wellness in mind right now? And how might it affect the future? And we'll start with you, Alessandra. Um, hold on a second. So, um, you know, the biggest challenge comes in questioning the concept of wellness, I think, and, and critiquing um, our own work, quite frankly. So wellness is personal, it's individual. Um, you know, we must break away from the stereotypes and the traditional preconceived notions. And I think like truly ask ourselves, like, what would the individual, how would the individual be happier and, and more balanced? And, and how can we enrich these lives and create better solutions that are, um, again, not cookie cutter, but are more um, right or appropriate for the person, for the use. And, um, and I think that's an important part of it. Um, for some, wellness is a sense of safety. Um, for others, it's about lavish luxury and entertainment. Uh, one of our clients is about privacy, and, you know, an escape uh, from the urban chaos in this example here. This is a luxury residence that's about uh, 12,000 square feet in, in northern part of Toronto and, and really it became for them their own oasis uh, where it became like a resort, quite frankly, because they travel so much and they wanted to bring that. They didn't want to stop that resort-like experience that they so... Uh, loved um, and continue to love um, they wanted to bring it into their home own homes and so this kind of sits on a hillside and we can't leave it a pool and kind of control the architecture and allow the master bedroom even to come off of the off onto the pool deck and onto its own um, uh, kind of tub area and hot tub area so you know I think it's um, this is the kind of thing that you know where we're seeing our clients trying to bring um, a lot of those memories from different spaces and different places into their own homes. And this is very powerful, especially now, I would say more so than ever, because, you know, it's now that we're really starting to see how our clients are really upping the game when it comes to especially private residential. Uh, we've uh, a lot of our private residential clients are really trying to ask us to push the envelope when it comes to their own homes. So it becomes, um, you know, something more than just, um, the concept of a kitchen and a dining room and a bathroom and a, you know, and a, and a, and a bedroom to sleep. Uh, and, and it's not necessarily just in the case of sizes, like in this beautiful home here, but it can also be done in, in smaller spaces for sure. So, um, yeah, no, we're definitely seeing this starting to evolve a lot more uh, with our spaces. Um, so I think we should just like here's actually a shot where off the master bathroom you kind of jump into this beautiful hot tub and again the use of the same material different textures of it which is a local material um the warm woods but this is here locally in the city if you can imagine that right not in california Kristen. it's here in toronto so <laughs> just want you to know we are it is capable but even in the winter months it'd be beautiful i mean they had the luxury of heating the entire outdoor space even in the slab so you know it really makes a difference and you can imagine just that beautiful mist that comes out so off of the floor itself, which in itself is, you know, such a, an emotive way to connect to the well-being and, and, and tapping into that um, more emotional state. Um, this is actually their gym and, um, and spa area. They actually have their own spa there, which is quite luxurious. Um, yeah, so um, we also have here a few, actually, there's a really cool shot of this one here, which is you know, this kind of concept of connecting, um, you know, your with your loved ones, where this is actually a back to back sink in a condominium project here. And so now what you're doing is rather than have a side by side sink, we're trying to think about, well, how do we evolve the concept of even standing by, side by side with one another? Can we float a vanity in the middle of a space? And can you still have a, a, a visual connection to your loved ones? So in this case here, while you have your own private moment in your in your in your mirror, just as you move to the right and have a conversation, it's all glass where you can still talk face to face to someone, right? And where the vanity itself and the faucets and the fixtures all, all become like pieces of art within, within, a, within a space of, of quietness. And, you know, and there's connections to 
um, you know, your, your closet spaces and, you know, the materials on walls and floors all enhance that experience, right? So, um, yeah. Thank Here's you. Another example. Andy. You're welcome. Um, <clears throat> I think that um, for me, the focus, when the question is really about the challenges that we are faced with today. And um, for all the obvious reasons um, in this world, state of affairs that we're living in right now, um, more than ever, uh, there are challenges now that we were focused on before about, uh, you know, private spaces. We talked about oasis where people can sort of uh, go to a corner and relax and be detached from the world and from their electronics and from their office and a sanctuary when they come home from their travels. Um, but I think now more than ever, there's a real uh, responsibility to design really with optimism in mind. Um, we're, we're at a time where everybody's just so fragile. And I think we need to look ahead to find solutions in, at all scales, in all building types, whether it's schools, hotels, private homes, high rises, retail, it impacts the entire world, all around the world, in everything that we do see, touch, feel, experience. And that's a real challenge. Um, I don't know if perhaps, you know, hopefully, God willing, this is gonna, we're gonna get back to some sense of normal, but I think it is going to be a new normal. And I think that we have to look even more to flexible spaces furniture that acts as, you know, more than one thing, a table that becomes, you know, rotates 90 degrees and becomes a shelf. Uh, there was an article actually that my dad showed me a couple of weeks ago in the New York Times or a bed that comes out of a ceiling on a hydraulic system. Murphy beds, which we all know from, I don't know when they were invented. Certainly they were here at the beginning of the uh, 20th century. And, uh, we need to design with flexibility. Um, we have to have technology available to everybody uh, to make it a fair and even playing field at schools and at businesses. And how do we integrate all of that into an environment in a cohesive, pleasing, aesthetic, you know, aesthetically pleasing manner? And I think that that's really tricky. I mean. I know what it takes to hide wires for a television. You know, I won't let a client just hang a TV with a retractable arm on the wall. And when you see it from the side, you can see all the guts and the arm and the wires. That's a really expensive detail to hide a television. You know, so we don't want to live amongst, you know, we, you don't want to have all this technology in your face. Um, and what is the way, um, that, that's a challenge for us as designers to figure out how to integrate it seamlessly and I hope beautifully because at the end of the day we don't want to sacrifice our beautiful environments and our beautiful spaces and our places of tranquility and calm and serenity that we've been talking about for 45 minutes. Um, that's the challenge and you know can, can a meeting room become an entertaining room? Can uh, uh, you know a dining room become a meeting room? Can uh, a den become a, a theater room or an extension of a playroom, like, uh, you know, movable walls and movable floors and movable uh, panels that rotate and pivot and in a really interesting sculptural way. I, I find that a fascinating and interesting challenge, um, but we definitely have to work on versatility and optimism. I love that. I love that. Kristen, we're going to end with you. Okay, so I think everything Cindy and Alessandro have said really resonate true with how we're thinking in our practice. Um, I think the biggest challenges now have less to do with wellness because that's a, been a critical thing in our practice and something that we've all learned so much this year. So I think the beauty of that is that it's become a fundamental thing in all practices and something that we talk about really clearly with our clients. So I think because it's fundamental, we know it's going to happen, but I think the bigger question is how do we all define wellness and what does it mean in a different project? So what is one person's wellness is different from another person. Someone might need a very 
um, sanctuary like bathroom with a wonderful spa like bathtub. And then another person might say, for me, wellness is gathering with the people I care about. And I wanna be in a big dining room connected to a kitchen where we prepare a meal together and we benefit from that connection together. Another person might say it's about a connection to the outdoors or a really wonderfully landscaped courtyard space. So I think for us, the challenge really specifically right now is when we can't get together with our clients and have the really amazing conversations where we explore a set of ideas together and figure out what wellness means to them. It's hard for us to figure out how together to review that. I would say similarly, after seeing Cindy pull out that material, that's also so crucial to us. We always look at um, materials with our clients, talk about the options, help really bring all of those things together. I mean, so much of it right now is on a screen. It's hard to touch a piece of stone or see how a, a tile might have a little bit of a sheen to it versus another one. So right now, I think those things that we know are really critical for wellness are much harder to bring into the products that we're developing as a team, meaning the design team and the clients and the contractor all together. So I think right now, those are the problems that we have. Um, optimistically, I'm looking forward to um, moving away from the work from home and the isolation, but I still think we're going to have a different sense of what it all means to come together. And so I think there will be new ways of understanding what priorities are and what communication is in the design process going forward. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Um, just to remind everybody, there, we're gonna have to abbreviate the Q&A, but all the questions will be answered via email afterwards. And thank you all. And here's Ricardo. Well, uh, with the lockdowns, everybody uh, couldn't wait to escape their homes, but with those interiors, uh, who would ever wanna leave? So anyway, uh, thank you all for the um, nice words about Fantini. We really appreciate your affection to our brand. So we have a first question from, uh, from Guta. Uh, how can we design a lighting to induce a feeling of gravity, um, weightness, similar to a gravity blanket effect? Is it possible? <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to think about the question there. <laughs> we are using some lighting systems. Um, Ketra makes a light that we use that changes throughout the day. So it's linked to different kinds of natural light to show the passage of um, seasons, to show the passage of a day um, and how the lighting changes throughout the day. So that is one thing that we are doing in order to make it feel more natural and understand the passage of time. So that might be one solution. Um, although it sounded like maybe the question was asking more about creating reduced light and, and a more sheltered experience. Um, maybe we, we, we are short on time. We will follow up on that one by email. We have from uh, Kimberly Brown um, is uh, the correlation between the materials and wellness. Uh, so uh, obviously when you source materials, you look for the appearance, the texture effect, but like, are you increasingly sourcing with sustainability in mind? And if so, what are you paying attention uh, the most uh, when evaluating sustainability? And uh, how, are you, how are you determining a material, uh, materials goodness? Well, I mean, I think we still look at sustainability in multiple ways. I mean, first of all, we try to source locally, especially when we're dealing with other countries. Like, for example, we have projects right now in Asia where we're trying to, as much as possible, um, find things locally for this particular project that I have in mind. But the other thing that we're doing with them is also paying attention to, like, not only materials, but also the local craftsmanship, people. In other words, coming back to the human species as well as not just materials. So. Where, where there's countries that do really work extremely well with their hands, we want to explore that. We want to be able to accentuate that within spaces where the, where the power of the hand is equal to the power of a machine, right, in many respects. So, you know, we look at sustainability both in materialistic ways as well as in human ways, right? So it's, it's something that we continue to explore within our projects, sure, and keeping things as local as possible when it does come to specifically like woods and stones and things like that but also the craftsmanship of, of you know, materials like fabrics and, 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 and craftsmanships of like even the hooked rug that I was telling you about earlier, so. 
Uh, we have one last question. We have more, but those will be answered uh, via email. So from Ren Miller, great presentation. Well, thank you. Uh, a lot of the examples you have mentioned um, seem to be about projects where the homeowners come to you already on board with well design. Um, what are the main advantages you would give um, to homeowners who aren't informed about your or initially interested in well design? Maybe what are the main the main advantage you would maybe advise. Maybe what are the main advices um, you would give to the homeowners who are aren't informed of interest? Does it make sense? I think instead of advantages, maybe advice or advantage. Anyway, I don't know if you have the question. What are the main advantages you would give to homeowners who aren't informed about or initially interested in well design? I think it's advice. So. Uh, if a homeowner maybe is not uh, very informed uh, and is embracing a new project, uh, what would be the advice? Um, I can take that. I, I think that um, it is up to us as designers uh, to be educators. Uh, first, we have to educate ourselves. And that's just like ongoing. I mean, you know, every day there are new products, there are new systems, there are new technologies. It's, it's difficult to keep up with. But first and foremost, we have to be informed. And then we really have to teach our clients and we have to help them and channel them and steer them down a path and help them focus on, I mean, even, you know, it's not always just about the beautiful fabrics and materials and stones and woods and rugs. It's about a good mechanical system for good air circulation, for good ventilation, for good natural ventilation, um, you know, which is just a, a, an open window and the access, uh, access to fresh air. Um, and if it's an enclosed space that doesn't have access to fresh air, just the mechanical system. I mean, my, my brother's a dentist and um, I actually joined a, a seminar for his, on his behalf. I listened on his behalf um, as a designer, as an architect, um, and it was all about this guy with a PhD in mechanical engineering talking about all the systems that are necessary, even just in his dental office. So, you know, in, in the world of COVID and then what's to come, and COVID is, is the first of what we're experiencing, it probably won't be the last. And we have to really be, have our infrastructure and our systems in place to be able to manage uh, what, what is to come. So it's, it's about everything. It's the infrastructure, it's the guts of the meat of the building, but it's also then all of those things that we can touch and see and feel, which, you know, I always say to clients, uh, you know, never, never try to save money on, on, on the basics, like the building envelope and the infrastructure and the structure and the mechanical and the electrical and all of those things. And then the rest, you know, you can get $4 a square foot tile that's stunning or you can get $40 a square foot tile or $140 a square foot tile that's stunning. But we have to, it's up to us to educate them to know where to put their dollars, where to focus, and to try to get an understanding of them, what their concerns are, and try to be able to answer that with a physical solution. Thank you. Well, um, we've come to the end um, of the session. I wanna really thank uh, Kristen, Cindy, Alessandro so much, sending a virtual uh, hug from, uh, from here, from Italy. And uh, we thank uh, all the audience for joining us today. And uh, please visit the website, uh, the, the Wellness Week website set up by Fantini to um, uh, be informed about uh, the other two events we're hosting uh, this week. So thank you all, uh, stay safe. We see you soon. Thank you, Ricardo. Thank you, everyone. Bye, Thank everybody. You,